I'm Eric Knorr, and welcome to True Technologist, where we speak with creators of groundbreaking enterprise technology. With me today is Matei Zaharia, the creator of Apache Spark, and also the CTO of Databricks, a cloud Spark provider. And uh, Matei is also an assistant professor at Stanford, so welcome. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Happy to be here. Great. Uh, you know, I'd like to start with a simple question, and that is, uh, you know, what is Spark, and why did it need to be created? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, so Apache Spark is a unified analytics engine for data processing on large clusters. Uh, basically, it allows you to combine many different types of data processing computations. Could be simple data transformations, or SQL, or machine learning, or stream processing, and combine them into an application and run it potentially at large scale. And um, the main reason that uh, I think this, this kind of engine had to be created is because uh, data processing, starting about 10, maybe 12 years ago, uh, suddenly had to scale out to very large clusters of servers. And this is essentially because individual servers stopped getting uh, faster, uh, but uh, data volumes kept going. So collecting data you know, was, was, was inexpensive, everyone could do it at scale, but then you need new technology to actually coordinate hundreds or thousands of servers to work with it. And um, there were a number of different uh, programming models and processing engines, you know, such as MapReduce or specialized engines like Giraffe for graph processing and so on. Uh, but uh, in, uh, in the lab I was in um, at UC Berkeley, we uh, decided it would be much easier if you could have a unified engine where you can combine these computations. So that's why we, we went in that direction. And uh, Matei, as, as I understand it, uh, you, you were at the AMP Lab in Berkeley mm -hmm. when you were creating this, and uh, Spark was sort of an accident, wasn't it? Yeah, in a, in a way, yeah. So I was actually um, at the AMP Lab at UC Berkeley, which was one of the earliest um, academic research labs to look at large-scale cloud computing. I was a PhD student there. And uh, we started, um, actually, I worked initially, um, I, I worked a bunch on, on um, Apache Hadoop and MapReduce, and I talked with early users of that. Uh, and then we started this other project, um, uh, Mesos, which you know right. became an Apache project as well, uh, which was a cluster manager. And initially, the goal of Mesos was we saw there were these different analytics tasks people wanted to do on clusters, and we wanted to have a resource manager to let you run these different engines. And we actually um, started Spark as an example of a specialized engine you could build on Mesos to do machine learning, because we had there were a number of people at Berkeley trying to do machine learning at scale, uh, and they found that the existing engines weren't uh, good for it. And then over time, we realized, you know, wait a minute, the same engine can also do MapReduce on disk. Uh, it can also do graph processing. It can also do stream processing. And moreover, it's actually very valuable to have these in a single programming model and engine. It's more efficient, and it's also uh, much easier to use. Uh, so we actually kind of moved the project towards what it is today, which is focusing on a unified engine. But it started really just trying to do this one use case that we, we thought other engines couldn't do well. No, I'd say there, there was uh, a, an engine of this type already, Hadoop. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. why, why did you see the need to create something mm -hmm. different? Yeah, so I actually worked um, pretty, starting pretty early on, starting in 2007 with uh, early users of Hadoop, such as uh, Facebook and Yahoo. And so I saw uh, basically across the users, there were some common trends. First of all, it enabled a new type of application working with these large data volumes on clusters, which was very valuable. But then second, what happened is when, as soon as people got started, they ran into things that the engine couldn't do. And the most common ones were actually machine learning, uh, which is these iterative computations that make many passes over the same data, and interactive queries, where again you want you know you want some data set that's very efficient uh, to access quickly. And so these came up repeatedly across all these companies. And uh, the MapReduce engine, it didn't look like the community wanted to extend the programming model beyond just doing map and reduce uh, you know better so uh, in our lab we wanted we wanted to see okay can we design a programming model that supports these but is still tractable and it still gives you the same scalability and and performance uh, as map reduce so that's that's the direction we went in 
pretty ambitious as an experiment uh, in, in a Berkeley lab. Uh, uh -huh. So, so uh, thinking back, right, I know Spark has had many improvements since then. Yeah. Um, is there anything you would do differently? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So I think th there were a few things that happened as we went along. So one of them um, that was actually quite surprising uh, to us at the time was when people uh, started using it for long running computations like stream processing. And uh, this is actually something that users started to do before we thought of trying to do it on top of the engine. So uh, we, you know, we, we put out the open source project and then uh, I remember I met some people at some, some uh, tech startups that were using it and they had these cool applications where it would, it would run for months, you know, loading new data and doing something. And the engine initially just wasn't designed to support that. For example, it never forgot a past computation. So if you keep running it for a month, it would eventually run out of uh, memory and, you know, it's trying to remember everything that it right. did. Um, so that that was one of the bigger changes that I think if, if we had done it from the beginning, it would have simplified things. Um, since then, we've we spent more time doing this. Um, and I think the other kind of surprising thing that happened later on is basically making it, adding the structured data uh, layer, which is called Spark SQL and data frames, which made it uh, much more accessible to people with, with a SQL background. And in, in hindsight, you know, that would have been great to have from the beginning, but initially the users of MapReduce were so far away from that that it wasn't obvious that um, uh, the, the users of SQL would also want to run in these engines. Yeah. So I would imagine you know some of these improvements are are part of the reason why Spark is the, is the dominant big data framework now. Uh, mm -hmm. wh why why else though? I mean, there's there's really no other competition out mm -hmm. there to to Spark now, and it's pretty much supplanted uh, Hadoop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think that that's a that's an interesting question. So I think I think actually in general in many areas of of computing, it makes sense for people to have a kind of a standard open source technology for something. So for example, you know, the, the dominant operating system is, is Linux and it's pretty useful for everyone involved because their skills transfer across companies, across use cases. You know, if you, if you understand how to work with Linux, you can work on a cell phone, you can work on a supercomputer. Uh, and as long as you have uh, uh, an open source project that, you know, is uh, actually uh, evolves with the community and that everyone can contribute to, it's actually good for people involved. So with, with Spark, one of the main goals that we had from the beginning is to enable a, an ecosystem so people can build libraries and tools around it that all work well together. Together. And then also we're uh, pretty um, strict about uh, trying to keep it very backwards compatible and trying to provide stability guarantees so, so it's not just shifting under people all the time. And I think as long as you're able to do that and also uh, actually keep up with innovation, like, you know, use new types of hardware, new programming languages, whatever comes out, um, it's, uh, it's kind of a, it, it's a, you sort of get this network effect where people feel they can build on it mm -hmm. and contribute to it. So, um, so uh, uh, I guess another way of saying that is you, you see it as a foundational technology now. So it, it, I think it is a type of technology, this type of you know cluster computing mm -hmm. engine that you're going to need in, in many different use cases. Um, and so we're trying to make sure that there's a very solid engine with not just what's in Apache Spark, but also the whole ecosystem of third party connectors and libraries that can safely build on it and can kind of benefit from the rest of the ecosystem. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so given the ecosystem, given all the improvements, what are some of the challenges today mm -hmm. in using Spark? Yeah, I, th there are definitely still some challenges. So I think even you know, despite all the the work that has gone into the engine, I think programming and especially debugging these kind of distributed applications can be difficult. So um, it, it can be hard to tell what's going wrong when you have a large data set and you can't look at all the data or when you have hundreds of machines and you know some of them are crashing, you don't, you don't really know why without chasing through. Um, so th this is probably the biggest area that I, I would uh, spend time improving uh, uh, because it, it, it is a lot of work. I mean, it's better than not using one of these engines. And sure. you can, you know, if you search the web or if you go to the mailing list, you can get lots of help, but it's still, um, it's still uh, difficult for people to get up to speed with. Can you get the ultimate value from Spark if you don't use Scala? 
Yeah, that's that's a good question. Yeah, so so the Scala programming language is what the the engine is written in, and it's the first one we supported. Yeah. Uh, and so there are some uh, some APIs that, um, especially older ones, that work better in Scala. But we've tried pretty hard to make it accessible in in other languages too. And I think for the new um, uh, kind of APIs, in, especially in Spark 2.0, all the structured data APIs, uh, we actually write them in Java first, uh, and then we, you know, in Scala, you call the same ones that you have there. And I think you can get the same benefits with both languages. We also see a huge amount of usage in in Python and in SQL, uh, you know, by different types of users. So we try to make sure uh, that works as well. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so I'd like to sort of zoom out a little and and get your take on uh, big data in general. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it's been 14 years since the MapReduce uh, paper was published by Google. Uh, uh, you know, what would you say are the types of big data workloads that are developing that are uh, delivering the most value to mm -hmm. enterprises right now? Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, I think there are a, a number of different workloads, and many of them have to do with new data sources that you you couldn't process with uh, with existing tools like say traditional data warehouses. Uh, but they are often uh, specific to each industry. There are fewer that are common across them. Probably the ones that would be common across uh, you know any enterprise would be uh, things like um, uh, like marketing, uh, you know, figuring out marketing data uh, or uh, network security or sort of infrastructure things like this the the more vertical specific ones you've seen I think a, a great example of this is actually in healthcare and pharma it's working with um, uh, with sequencing data you can get from DNA sequencing and in general with high throughput sort of sensor data there are so many ways you you know if you have patients in a hospital so many high volume sources of data you get like images uh, sensor readings and so on uh, and and there are quite a few, uh, basically all of the pharma companies are kind of uh, changing their drug development process to work based on these large volumes of data. And these are things where, you know, everyone expects a, a 10x increase in the amount of data in the next few years, and you, you can't uh, fit it into a traditional data warehouse. It's the wrong data type, it's the wrong operations. Um, and I think similar things arise in other industries. You've got images, you've got, uh, you know, machine logs, um, all kinds of sensor data, that, I, Internet of Things, these types of, uh, of data sources. That's why I think people have the most value because they just couldn't do it at all before. Mm -hmm. Well, Mate, you mentioned that uh, machine learning was uh, was a critical concern at the very mm -hmm. beginning of the creation of Spark. Do you see machine learning and and uh, Spark as inseparable? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think the, definitely the uh, everyone using Spark wants to do some type of machine learning. In my experience, they also do other things with it. But often, the main reason to um, you know to prepare a large data set or to start looking at the data is to do some kind of machine learning, or at least it's a tool that they'll consider. So it's something that we've aimed to support since the beginning. As I said, at, at the beginning, actually, we started it because we talked with people who wanted to do machine learning with right. Hadoop, and they found it couldn't uh, it couldn't perform well and scale well. Um, and it's also something that we've continued to, uh, to do, both by adding stuff in Spark's uh, machine learning library and also by integrating with, with external tools that people use. So, Matei, you're CTO of, uh, of Databricks. Um, what, what does Databricks mean by unified analytics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in Databricks, we, we talk a lot about unified analytics, and we actually mean two different things. So one thing uh, we mean is the same thing I said about, uh, about Apache Spark, which is uh, in a single sort of programming model and interface, you can do different types of analytics tasks and actually connect them together into a pipeline and make that easy. Uh, so that's, you know, can you do machine learning and, and, and SQL and graph processing on the same data? But then the second thing we mean is actually at the scale of of a, an organization you know, working with data is uh, letting the different people and the different roles in that organization work well together. So for example, we talk a lot about unifying data science and engineering. In, in many enterprises, these are different teams and it creates a huge amount of friction. Basically, the data engineering team owns the data. They're very conservative about uh, you know, adding new 
jobs on top of it or loading new data sources or transforming it. And then the data science team is the one with all the domain experts that can potentially build interesting business applications. And just because of the way the tooling works, uh, there's this friction where it's very hard to, you know, for the data science team to deploy code. It's very hard for the data engineering team to trust that things will work if they accept stuff from there. So uh, what, what we mean by unified analytics is if, if data and analytics are a core part of your business, you need, you know, you need the equivalent of, say, Salesforce, where uh, everyone in the organization can, can collaborate and can be productive working with that. Mm -hmm. So uh, what, is, what is Databricks, which is a, a cloud platform, cloud mm -hmm. provider, uh, what does it offer that the big clouds don't, don't mm -hmm. offer? You know, AWS, Google Cloud Platform, mm -hmm. Azure. Um, they all have Spark, so yeah. and and you're uh, I believe you're on AWS uh, yeah. as, as a platform as well. So we are, what yeah. do you what do you offer that they don't? Yeah, offer? so so the main thing we offer is we offer a complete. Uh, platform for working with data. We don't just launch a cluster with Spark on it and tell you, okay, now log in and, and try doing some stuff. We have all the other pieces you need around that. So we have, for example, a data catalog that you can use to manage uh, all the data in the organization. We have access control and, and security mechanisms. So you can say, okay, these users can only access this data. You can, um, you can build audit logs, see what people are doing. Uh, and we also have this workspace which allows you to create uh, interactive notebooks where you can collaborate a little bit like Google Docs but for working with code and with results uh, or to create jobs that you schedule. So um, essentially, you know, what, what we see is often when people look at uh, one of the, the, the cloud providers, they see, okay, there are, you know, 20 different services for working with data in there and I have to decide how to stitch them together and build a platform and if I mess it up and, you know, I, I've never built it before so I, I may well right. mess it up, uh, then, then I'll be in trouble. Whereas with Databricks, we tell you, okay, here's a platform, it's been you know, we, we've designed it, it's been proven to scale and it, it will ensure that all the things you realize you need to do, like should I need to go and, you know, build an audit of like what went into mm -hmm. my model uh, are actually built into the platform. Right, yeah. right. So instead of just simply a workbench, mm -hmm. you're you're putting a lot of different services around uh, around Spark to yeah. make it easy. Yeah, and also and yeah. crucially, we're designing them to work together, so have mm -hmm. the same security model, make it easy to take this code, for example, a notebook that you used in the data science team, and run it as a job, and let the engineering or IT team still control, you know, the costs around it, or manage how it runs, or get alerts. Um, so, so these things that you know that, that let you be productive as a as a bigger organization. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, so, uh, what do you see as some of the most important uh, innovations around Spark, but mm -hmm. not within the Spark project mm -hmm. itself? Yeah, there's quite a bit going on, um, uh, both kind of on the data analytics side and also um, on, on the machine learning side. Um, so some things um, that are happening, so one, uh, within Spark itself, I guess, one thing that uh, was added into the, the project recently was the ability to run it on Kubernetes, uh, which uh, just makes it easier to deploy in many environments where you don't have the traditional Hadoop stack. And we're seeing that come up a lot. It's People say, well, I, I don't even, uh, I already have a storage system, it's not Hadoop, so I don't want to run a second Hadoop cluster to do analytics. So I think that's an interesting change. And uh, of course, at Databricks, we've been running, uh, essentially our, our whole product is running, at a, running Spark against cloud storage, which is also not using Hadoop. So I think that's an interesting change there in terms of where it runs. Um, and then the other, uh, I'd say, really interesting space is the integrations with new machine learning algorithms and mm -hmm. frameworks. So deep learning on Spark, uh, different ways to integrate with, with TensorFlow. Actually, in TensorFlow, there is a Spark connector to, to move data between them. Uh, and I think these are also uh, really interesting to see because the machine learning is powered by data. And so with Spark, you can process, transform, select the data, and then you can feed it into, into your favorite engine and algorithm. Uh, what do you see as the significance of the auto ML uh, framework? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, quite a few companies are, are working on what they call auto ML. It, it, it can mean different things, but it basically, mm -hmm. it means um, automated uh, tuning and search for a machine learning model that solves a specific problem. And I think um, as, a, as, a, as a 
technique. It's, it's very useful. It's something that a lot of um, data scientists and machine learning experts want, is they want to quickly search a space of parameters. So actually, this is one of the most common uh, use cases we have uh, for Spark with, with machine learning, is uh, even if you have a small data set, uh, you might use Spark to, uh, to launch hundreds, thousands of experiments in parallel and see which model does best. Um, at the same time, I think the auto ML vision sometimes is, um, is a little bit overstated where you say mm. you won't need a machine learning expert at all mm. and you'll get a really good model. I think that's very difficult to do in, in many cases, maybe not in all cases. Maybe because a little naive. Huh? It, it could be, yeah. b because often the problem in machine learning is actually, it's just even defining your objective. Like what does mm. it mean, for instance, to improve uh, you know, our lead scoring process or something like that. Uh, and, and that's that's a hard problem. That's like, you, you need to think about, wait, what does it mean? How can these metrics be wrong? Am I optimizing for the wrong thing? And that's not covered by the auto ML frameworks. So all they do is if you give them an objective, they'll do different things to try to improve that. Um, so I do think, it, you know, basically you might use auto ML, the, 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 the sort of, the vision where you know anyone can click a button and, and use that without being an ML expert, it might work for, some applications that uh, you know you you don't care about the result being the very best. You just want it to be okay. But it's not going to work, for example, if it's a mission critical thing. If you you know you're mm -hmm. trying to like uh, combat fraud and and eliminate it, you're not going to say, well, you know, we're okay being within ten percent of of right. the right uh, answer here. Or like you're trying to build a self driving car, you're not going to say, well, let's just press the auto ML button and let it go. Right. So yeah. Right. So, mm -hmm. so ways, a ways to go before, before yeah. we get there. But certainly yeah. the, the version of it that's for the machine learning expert mm. to run lots of experiments, that is very common and very powerful. And I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so what is uh, Databricks role or, and how do you see your role in, in mm -hmm. cultivating the open source community around mm -hmm. Apache Spark? Yeah, so for us it's very important to, uh, to have a, a, a healthy uh, open source community where many different people can, can contribute to the project because of course we base um, a lot of our uh, product around the project, uh, but also it's just valuable for all our customers, all, all the users of Databricks if they can get access to great libraries and functionality. Uh, so the things we do, apart from contributing code to the project, which, which everyone does, we've also spent a lot of time uh, on providing uh, training materials and many of these are free because we, we just wanted many people to be able to learn best practices about how to use the project and do things with it. Um, so for example, uh, a couple of years ago we ran uh, four different uh, massive online courses on Apache Spark. All of them were, were free courses. They were taught by Berkeley professors uh, uh, who were you know, very good, uh, you know, very good teachers. Uh, and they reached around 100,000 people who signed mm. up for the courses. And all that material is on there. We also provide a lot of tutorials and examples to help people get started. So um, it's, it, it, it helps us and I think it helps all the existing users if, uh, if it's easy to learn about the system and to find uh, answers to questions about it. Right, so my last question, uh, Matei, is what to expect from Databricks in the coming year? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a lot of interesting uh, things happening. So um, I'll just mention a couple of them uh, that we actually uh, talked about at the uh, at the Spark and AI Summit conference that we ran just a few weeks ago. So it's our, our big conference. Uh, uh, so uh, one of the projects that I'm actually uh, uh, quite involved in uh, is a new uh, open source um, system for managing the machine learning life cycle. It's called MLflow and it's about managing, uh, it's not about just running machine learning algorithms, but it's actually about uh, managing the, the whole life cycle around that. So how, once you've built models, how do you deploy them? And as you build them, how do you keep track of what went into each one? What data, uh, what parameters, uh, what code went into it, uh, so that you can go back and you know, switch to an older model or reproduce the results and so on. And this is, a, this is very similar to uh, sort of what I talked about with, with data platforms. So we see every uh, organization that's serious about machine learning, they'll do maybe one use case or two use cases, and then they'll ask, wait a minute, how can I scale this to be able to have lots of these use cases? Uh, and they realize they need to have a platform and a process around machine learning. 
uh, similar to how you have a process around software development, for example. And there aren't really good open source tools to do that. So uh, we started this project. It works with Spark, of course, but it also works with any other uh, machine learning system you want to use, and it lets you manage th this life cycle. And so is, is Flow an Apache project as well? Or? Uh, it's an Apache licensed uh, open okay. source project, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It's not a part of the Apache Software Foundation, but it, it's just a new project that we launched. Well, yeah. great. Well, Matei, it's really been a pleasure uh, speaking with you, and, and thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, no problem. Thanks a lot for having me.